Thud. Pound. The sound hits my eardrums with the same force as whose ever hand just made contact with my front door. Pound. Thud. Pound. I set down my coffee, the only vice I get these days. Draped in a plush white robe, I made my way to the disturbance. My mind raced at 7.30 a.m. on a Tuesday. Who in God's name could possibly be demanding my attention at this hour? My emotions began jumping between trepidation and rage. I started what felt like the mile-long walk towards my front door, each step laborious, as if I was dragging a millstone. Pressing my body against the cool metal frame, I peered through the peephole. It was, pitch it was pitch black as if something was covering it. One more loud thud of a fist against the door and an angry man's voice resonated over the threshold. Open up now, police. We will break this door down. My usually sturdy hand trembled as I clasped the bronze deadbolt, the only thing sep separating me from abject terror. As I turned the handle, the momentum of the door flying open sent me staggering back, clutching my robe lest I flash anyone. My gaze immediately focused on some sort of glock pointing directly at my forehead. The angry man's voice, lathered in animosity, barked, move and you're dead. In that moment, I feared I was getting robbed. This cannot be happening, I lament half under my breath, still staring down the barrel of a cocked handgun. Why did I open the door? My heart is pounding in my ears. My eyes dart in all directions, desperate to assess the situation. Okay, there are at least five men, large men with jarhead haircuts. One had a beard, the other's clean shaven, but for the man standing directly in front of me, he had a soul patch. They look as if they were pulled from main casting for a Jason Bourne film. They look like the bad guys. My eyes lock on some shiny objects breaking up the monotony of their all-black ensemble. They have flair. They have badges and pins and one large gold brooch adorned each man's thick flak jacket with the words, Harbor Police, inscribed in bold royal blue filigree. I'll be damned. It's the police. I'm getting raided, not robbed. But the harbor police? What are they doing in Chula Vista? With that thought, my sweet cocker spaniel Violet bolts from between my legs, her little nub of a tail wagging vigorously, eager to greet her many new friends, holding the largest weapons I had ever seen in real life. A stocky man stands perched behind my barren sycamore tree with an AK-47, and Violet has chosen him to be her first new acquaintance. My voice breaks the short moment of silence. Please don't kill my dog. I shriek. Soulpatch snarls. Who else is inside? I explain it's just my roommate, Sarah. And while I plead for them to let me wrangle my dog, I am forcibly led barefoot into my front yard. A few men rush past me. Another pats me down. Sarah emerges with her hands up, squinting in the crisp morning light, cloaked in an identical white robe. We look like we all planned matching outfits, but only the men did. She is led to kneel beside me beneath the barren sycamore tree, our fingers interlocked atop our head, elbows wide, eyes swelling with fear. Crash! I hear my bedroom door kicked in. There has to be some mistake. I try in vain to get the man with the AK-47 trained on us to communicate with me. Sarah, a 22-year-old nursing student, is on the verge of a panic attack. In the most persuasive tone I can muster, I say, can we please go inside? You're causing a scene. This is all a big misunderstanding. I worry what the neighbors will think with their homemade morning coffee and their normal nine-to-five jobs. The thought strikes me. I sound like my mother. I hate that I care what the neighbors will think, but I do. Soul Patch, a gruff man, the shortest of the bunch, is the ringleader. He finally relents to my pleads for privacy, and so, while holding Violet on my lap, I ask, can I see the warrant? His dark eyes glare, and with a facial expression somewhere between a smirk and a sneer, he says, see this, gesturing with his pistol, this is all the warrant I need. Okay, fair. Fair. What else am I to say to that? Who would I call the police? The thought tickles me in an uncomfortable way. 
Soul Patch continues. We want your guns, your drugs, your computers, and your money. I nervously laugh as I repeat his demands back to him, starting with the guns. I pause after the S passed my lips. I huff the words with heavy skepticism, the same way I did when I learned that people in England call the trunk of a car the boot. It sounded so silly. I continued, I don't know where you're getting your information, but we started this legal delivery dispensary over a year ago. It's completely legitimate under California Prop 215. I have all the paperwork. If you would just allow me to, I can get you our articles of incorporation. My run-on sentence is interrupted. The bearded man is leaning halfway in our home from the attached garage. He locks eyes with me. What are these large metal contraptions for? Shit. Okay, those are not legal. At least not for our express purposes. My girlfriend, who was at that very moment in Northern California attempting to procure our largest bulk purchase of marijuana to date, had big dreams of turning our little delivery dispensary into a weed empire. She wanted to complete with our own shatter manufacturing operation. We had recently purchased six industrial vac ovens to be installed in an empty bedroom. And though she knew, I was still unaware of the specific science behind how one could blast pounds of marijuana into small pieces of golden globs of highly concentrated weed, or as it's commonly known, shatter. I did, however, understand that it carried a drug manufacturing charge similar to methamphetamine. The man with the beard and Officer Soul Patch awaited my response with blank stares. Without skipping a beat, I said, I'm a baker. Those are ovens, and I'm starting a business. My thoughts turned to our drop house nestled in a small apartment in the heart of Hillcrest. It was perfect place for our delivery drivers to re-up on product, to deposit the cash they had collected. I thought, jokes on these cops. They messed up and came to my home instead of the stash house. For the first time in what felt like hours, some resemblance of relief washed over me. They seemed to buy my ridiculous excuse. I thought, how could they not know what they're looking at? They must do this all the time. Why won't he show me the warrant? My musing is interrupted. I can hear men scurrying about my 1,500 square foot home. They're searching diligently. They punch holes in walls, dresser's drawers fly open. They empty cabinets and with one sweeping motion displace all contents onto the floor, searching like little junkies. I know, I know, you want guns, drugs, computers, and money. I'll give you the drugs, easy, take them. You can have my personal computer and there's not much cash to speak of, maybe three grand. I continue, there, there are no guns. We aren't that kind of operation. We are a legal dispensary. I recognize in that moment that I sound ridiculous. The legality of my business under state law did not exempt me from the necessity of possessing a firearm to dissuade potential robbers, obviously. Where there are drugs and money, there is the increased likelihood of miscreants attempting to rob you. Soulpatch seemed less angry and more confused at this point. Someone had given him incorrect information. What a shock. An informant, a lowly snitch, was less than reliable. Another lackey joins the round table. A 5'8 man, obviously making up for his short stature with large muscles. Officer Steroid had been in charge of procuring our phones and our passcodes, lest us girls call anyone and really muck this up. He was scrolling through my contacts and periodically looking up at me and asking things like, who is Ashley AA? Who is Jared NA? What about Jennifer HA? Kylie Spawn C? What do the letters mean? What's a Spawn C? With a dead-eyed stare and a know-it-all tone, I responded, ah, yes. Those are people from Alcoholics Anonymous or other anonymous programs. I'm sober. The two men look at each other with amused skepticism and the closest thing I've seen yet to smile. I don't get high, I just sell. It's a legal business. My voice trails off once more. I've been sober for the better part of three years and my internal concerns regarding the optics of being a C-minus 
sober drug dealer, were soothed and quailed by consistently telling myself and others that it's all legal. And though I knew it surely was not. The other officers are coming downstairs now, mostly empty handed. I'm trying not to look smug, but I am. My feelings of rage regarding the perceived injustice of my home being invaded began to slowly creep back in, warming my cold, clammy hands a few degrees. They did not find much of anything because there was not much of anything to be found. Officer Soulpatch must have picked up on my feelings of victory in this battle because he says with a striking glance, you know, we're hitting your drop house as we speak. Shit. That is where most of the drugs and money will be. Still no guns, but definitely drugs and money. There is nothing I can do. They have me dead to rights. I just have to sit and wait for this part to be over. To inevitably let it be let out in handcuffs, I begin to dissociate, staring blankly, finding momentary visual escape out the kitchen window. It was a lovely Southern California day, sans these men intent on destroying everything we had worked so hard for. I'm going to jail, I think. If this is federal, each weed container is a count, and I'm going to have thousands of counts against me. Suddenly, I blinked out of my haze, and they were all leaving. Satisfied, they had taken everything they could find. I was handed my phone back. They took the money, mostly ones equaling 100, intentionally tied with taut rubber bands. They even asked me to empty the singles from my wallet. They took what little drugs were scattered about the home, mostly samples from prospective vendors. They took my girlfriend's prescription medication, my roommate's iPad, and my computer, then left. One of the employees at the drop house called to tell me everything was gone, except for hundreds of edibles in the refrigerator and thousands of empty containers. They were gone. I wasn't going to jail. I was simply getting robbed by road cops.